Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our uh, weekly colloquium. This time, our visitor is Krzysztof Nishinbe from University of Warsaw. Uh, Krzysztof uh, did his master thesis at University of Warsaw as well, in the group of Professor Marek Nadrykowski. Uh, then he moved to Vienna, um, where he did his PhD under Robert Zeilinger in Kloster Neubuch near Vienna, where he worked on colorons. And now he's uh, he's working again at the University of Warsaw and, uh, under the supervision of uh, Krzysztof Jachymski, and he will talk about simulating critical ion chemistry with indirect excitons. So the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm pleasure to be invited here. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, I will be talking about something. Just I was told to prepare something relatively non-technical and accessible. And I chose something actually we did very recently, uh, and it's connected to something called the maximal ionization problem, which is a very basic problem in quantum chemistry, which is still unsolved. So I will somehow tell you a little bit about it. Uh, then I will also tell you about how to turn this problem around and uh, introduce the concept of the critical nuclear charge. I will tell you a few words about our say, model uh, model problems, our model physical system, which is the iDrive anion. Okay, so I will tell you something about what is known about it and it's something about its importance. Uh, then, uh, referring to the critical nuclear charge, I will try to introduce uh, uh, another setting, uh, which essentially is about charges, particles interacting via Coulomb forces, which are imposed on which certain geometric constraints are imposed. And in this context, I would claim that this can be modeled by indirect excitons, for instance. I will tell you something about what excitons are and direct excitons are. Then I would present something about our result. It's a very simple creation of calculation. However, it has some nice features like power loss merging, which can one can use to describe the critical nuclear charge and the critical finite mechanisms. Okay, and then of course, our calculation is very simple. It only takes into account the automatic constraints. I will be forced to somehow discuss some of the limitations and the outlook of what can be done as uh, otherwise uh, in this setting. Okay, so first we start with the introduction of the maximal ionization problem. So just consider a system of N electrons, okay, non-relativistic electrons in one immobile nucleus, which has charge Z. And all these, uh, all these particles interact by the usual Coulomb forces. One can write down the Hamiltonian in the atomic unix, which looks like this. Okay, we have the kinetic energy of the electrons. The mass is set to one in the atomic units. That's the Coulomb attraction to the nucleus and the Coulomb repulsion of all the uh, electrons. And the maximal ionization problem is the following. So given the number Z, okay, the nuclear charge, how many N can you put such that you have a bound state in the system? Which means that, uh, so in non-technical terms, essentially means that the ground state of the system is, a, uh, is such that the probability of having any of the electrons of the N electrons at infinity is zero. In more mathematical terms, it just says that, the, uh, that there exists a ground state for this Hamiltonian or that the Schrodinger equation, the solution of the Schrodinger equation with the smallest possible energy is an N2 function in all the electron coordinates, in all the N electron coordinates, okay? And of course, you could expect that if N is too large compared to Z, then essentially the Coulomb repulsion wins and the additional electrons are sent away to infinity and only, I say, certain species uh, remains. And uh, of course, things like this exist. Okay, so we can have non-neutral systems which are stable in vacuum, and these called these things are called anions. Uh, and I, I've listed a couple of them here with their say um, importance. So I know hydride is like our model system, as I told you, and this is somehow important for stereos. It is important for stereo spectroscopy. I will try to maybe refer, say something about it in a moment. The so fluorides is added to toothpaste. Okay. Iodides is important for proper functional pyroid. That's where people go to the sea because sea salt contains lots of these ions. So it's important. So people with like pyroid malfunction are 
or uh, advise to go to the sea for this reason. Chloride, everybody knows it's from salt, but it also exists in vacuum and it's important for ion balance in blood, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so these things exist. And the main point that these things exist in vacuum, because my main point is that actually, so you can add more electrons to the system. So first you have charge C equal to three, you can add four electrons. And in fact, you can add more, but the point is that it appears that in the vacuum, you can add only one, okay? So in solvents, you can have more of them, okay, in water, but it appears that in vacuum, you can add only one of them, respectively of Z. And that's the maximal ionization conjecture, because the maximal ionization conjecture says the following, so regardless of the value of Z, the maximal number of, the, of electrons that you can add to the system in the vacuum equals one, okay? So just, just one additional electron you can add to the system regardless of the value of Z. Uh, so, sorry for my question. I understand that this type of uh, hydride storage and so on, these ions exist have some finite lifetime, or are they? No, these are stable species. These are completely absolutely. stable species. If you yes, if you put them in free space, they will stay there forever. I see. That's yeah, and for there, they will stay there forever. Exactly. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so the conjecture, like the strong conjecture is that you can add just one more electron to the system to have a bound state, but a weaker version is just, it says that the maximum number, given Z, the maximum number of electrons that you can add to the system is Z plus C, where C is a universal, con universal constant independent of Z. So if you somehow imagine having atoms of Z one million, and the point is that it cannot be twice times two million, it does not scale with Z. The point is that it doesn't scale with Z, just a fixed number, okay? Of course, if it's what, 2 million is academic, but even this conjecture is unknown because the main point of this is actually nobody knows how to prove such an inequality, okay? It's essentially unknown, okay? There are results in this direction, but nobody knows why, how to explain the fact that this number cannot increase with Z to such an extent, okay? It's Z plus some certain constant. Okay, so as I told there, it, this is in fact an open question. But of course, there have been partial results in this direction, uh, very deep, very beautiful results. The first one I know is by Elliot Lee. He has essentially proven that the, max, the maximum number of electrons that you can add to a nucleus of charge Z is smaller than 2Z plus 1, okay? Uh, so as we see, actually, it's good for hydrogen because it says that actually you only have hydride you can, and you can have two because three is already breaks this inequality, okay? So there's no H2 minus if you like. And um, however, this two here, it's, I mean, it's enough for the for hydrides, but uh, for, 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 for hydrogen, but uh, essentially it's not good, the two here. And the reason why it's not good is another result by like this big guys in mathematical physics. They have proven the following because this NSC of Z, it's a sequence of course of Z, and you can create this type of sequence and C of Z divided by Z. And they have proven that if you send Z to infinity, the limit is one. In other words, you have something called asymptotic neutrality, okay? So if you imagine, say, very, very extremely large atoms with this addition, then they can form stable species with uh, electrons whose number is essentially Z, okay? So asymptotically, every, say, large bound states of electrons and uh, nuclei are neutral, okay? And uh, if you actually but look this, at Lips to yes. this Lip, Seagull, et cetera, result, the, the, does it still uh, assume a point like? Uh, yes, it's for um, it, everything is point like, and the nucleus is infinite of infinite mass. Yes, yes. But there's a difference in between the two because you see, uh, because in Lipps proof is actually quite simple. It's very clever, but it's quite simple. It's a three line proof. It's from directly from the Schrodinger equation, and the only thing he actually uses there is that the square of the wave function of the n electrons is symmetric in the electronic coordinates. He doesn't use that the actual wave function is anti-symmetric, whereas this other proof of the asymptotic neutrality, then the Pauli principle is essential, actually. If you would, they use the fact that the actual wave function of the electrons is anti-symmetric, and if actually you change the assumption of anti-symmetry to symmetry, the proof breaks down. So actually this points out that Pauli principle is sort of essential for these mechanisms, okay? Mm -hmm. Right, so it's not, it's unfortunately it cannot be seen from Leap's uh, calculation, but it can be seen from this, uh, from this. And people actually were working, say, on improving this, these facts, uh, like having better bounds on this, for instance. And actually, from a certain point of view, this 
conjecture has been proven, but only in Hartree-Fock theory by uh, Jan Philipp Solovey some 20 years ago. But this is only in Hartree-Fock theory, so he assumes that the wave function is just a Slater determinant. Okay, so if you assume that the wave function is a Slater determinant, you can prove the this conjecture. But of course, the actual wave function is not a Slater determinant, so it's uh, still not the right. Uh, it's not the proof of the conjecture. However, it's still so deep that it that accept an analysis of mathematics like to the highest math, math paper. Uh, and there is there are actually new results. Quite um, uh, from point of view of mathematics, it's recent. Ten years ago, so Fan um, Nam he has actually improved this tool to one point twenty two. And actually, from this perspective, see it's it's good, right? Because actually, you want to break everybody who wants to improve these results or these results. Want what he needs to do is to what they need to do is to put this constant down to one. Okay, and that's like the quest. And Nam has succeeded in changing this two to a 1.2 essentially at the price of having not a constant here, but something which scales with Z. Mm -hmm. But if you actually compare these two bounds, then for larger atoms, this NAMS uh, bound is better already for Z larger than Z, okay? You see? So people are still working on it. That's a very interesting mathematical problem. And uh, a very nice branch of mathematics emerging from it. Uh, so, so I would I would change. So let me just change the order of the slides, okay? Because I just wanted to make my point that this is difficult, okay, to prove this. This so this is a very basic problem of quantum chemistry, which like an industry now we can somehow predict almost everything what happens with materials in quantum chemistry method. But these basic problems like this are still unsolved. And the real reason why is it so hard is that actually we don't understand the phenomenon of electron correlation in a way. Okay, so of course, electron correlation is a proper field of science in itself, right? There are thousands of people working on it. But actually, it's not that we really understand it in simple terms that we can somehow turn into a proof that can prove like conjecture like this. Okay. And this it's that it's, it's a fact of life. I will come to this that this.
So if I go back to the uh, Hamiltonian, I change the z and I treat it just like a coupling constant. Okay, it, I forget it's it, that this in this uh, unit it needs to be an integer. I just let's assume it's just a coupling constant. Okay, and I ask, okay, so given n, how small can the z be for the system to have a bound state? Okay, <coughs> and the minimum value of z that allows you to have a bound state in the system, the manual of z treated as a coupling is called the critical nuclear charge. And this is something that you can effectively compute using quantum chemistry methods. And you see that for this helium isoelectronic sequence, so this the two electrons, okay, this has been determined to be this number. So you see it has been determined to quite high degree of accuracy. So which somehow maybe points out that actually serious people were using serious methods to determine this for the sake of this problem. Okay. Uh, and this again, an infinite nucleus max approximation. Okay. So that's the critical nuclear charge. Okay, so a slight reformulation. We again fix n and look at the z. Okay, and treat it as, as like a coupling, like something continues. So we pretend it's not a not an integer. Good. Uh, all right, and that's one. That that I like. That's the essential point. And from the point of view of I will be saying later, is the fact that you see. So this uh, phenomenon of changing the z. That's one parameter of yours. And there is another one, which you could think is like the mass ratio of the electrons to the protons. So just now don't have the initial, just have a free body Coulomb system to the identical particles in one of opposite charge and just change the masses of them. And you can reproduce somehow what happens in the parameter state. Do you have a bound state or a bound state or not? And actually you can have a sort of like a first, like maybe rather second order phase transition curve separating the two, okay? And this is something that you can do. And actually, um, okay, so I maybe you, because what, what's on the axis, right? Uh, uh, so K is something that's related to the mass ratio and lambda is the coupling constant, okay? More or less. So you have like a continuum from H to plus, which is like two protons. And so the two guys are heavy, one is very light. And the other extreme is the one is one is very heavy, two others are very light. Okay, so that's our like helium, our H minus. This so actually you can go from here to here continuously by changing this, and there is a line in this parameter space separating the region where you have a bound state and we don't have a bound state. Okay. Good. Um, all right. So we want to understand something about this problem as well, and. Uh, what we are trying to do is actually to maybe see, okay, this new critical nuclear charge for n equal to 0 0.921, fine, we know it, but you can really see it, right? It's not something that you can see because Z is an integer. We're thinking, okay, so maybe if we play around with Coulomb systems and maybe add something to them, then maybe you can see something that's sort of critically bound, but maybe can be measured. And to, one of the platforms that we think about is direct excitons, and these are essentially bound states of electrons and holes, uh, which are formed in such a way that you have, say, one layer of a material, and then you have electrons, and there's another layer below or somewhere else that you have holes, okay? And they actually can feel their Coulomb attraction, okay, their electrostatic interactions, and they can form bound states, say, across the boundaries of the of the, of the materials, okay? And such things exist, and they are called the direct excitons. Right? In, uh, in comparison to like usual excitons, wherein these uh, holes and electrons they form bound state within one material. Okay, they look more or less like the hydrogen atom. Then the indirect excitons they look like a bit different than atoms. Okay, and molecules because of the boundary. Okay, because of the geometric effects. And these uh, things already have been employed for the purpose of I would call simulation. Okay, so using one system to say somehow it's a completely other system. Okay, and uh, these guys actually um, promising similarity of strongly positive systems because they have a permanent dipole moment, right? There's an electron here and a hole here, then they have a permanent dipole moment, so they can really interact strongly with it, and they will repel, repel each other. Okay. And here, just a table of from the like Lampert in the 50s, it was actually considered the binding energies of these like complexes of electrons and holes, and compared them with like this uh, with the usual chemical analogs, so to say. Okay, so this idea which somehow goes back very far. Okay, so our setting is something very, very simple. So, okay, uh, 
you want to create a, a bound state out of this setup you just have one layer which is very thick, very very thick and another which is very thin in the thin layer we have positive charges so you have holes and in the latter one we have electrons could also change them okay uh, and uh, just to get very straight to 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 what is known as so suppose that the mass of effective mass of the hole is much larger than the effective mass of the electrons and then you can create like this atomic like system where the Hamiltonian looks exactly like that one for the hydrogen uh, anion okay with a where, where in the hole has charge z okay but we say that the electrons cannot pass this boundary okay so we model this as a like infinite value potential at the boundary which here i chose to be the plane z equal to zero for the electrons okay so i just have a regular system with the zeros up here so the z can be only positive for the electrons i have like infinite potential barrier at the boundary okay and i'm asking okay do i have a bound state of this or not and uh, i again keep the z as uh, a coupling and I look what the but it is uh, three dimensional. It's three dimensional, yes. It's and uh, what is the shape in this direction? So it's like essentially a plane with a hole. So it's a half space, and on the boundary of the so half space, we just infinite. have infinite. Yes, ah, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So it's just like a, mm -hmm. just, the only thing we care is here the the the, 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 the geometric constraints. Of, mm -hmm. of course, because you have two different layers, you have like this. Uh, image charges appearing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We neglect that for the moment. I'm not saying it can, it can be neglected. We're just saying we are interested in what geometry does the system. We will think about the dielectric effect later. Okay. But so the geometry is that you do not allow electrons to penetrate. Exactly. Space. Yes. They just live in half space, and somewhere on the plane separating the half space they live from the half space they cannot see is, is a hole. Okay, mm -hmm. and it attracts them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially a, Hamil a regular Hamiltonian for like two electrons and and, and one say nucleus. Mm -hmm. But with the boundary condition that the wave function vanish at, at, the, at, at the boundary, okay, like a Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay. okay. Is it clear? Well, otherwise, right? otherwise, it's a black home state, both in above and below the plane. Okay, sorry, can you re repeat? Uh, uh, but uh, there is no other material, polarizable material above and, and below. Uh, it's black home. Yes, I, I neglect the polarization. Yes, um, I neglect it. Essentially. Yes, I just ask about, I'm only asking about the <laughs> geometry, right? So that's right, that essentially you have these dielectric effects. And uh, in principle, I would say you cannot really neglect them. But uh, of course, the pure geometry also play a role. Just we are just interested in the fact of geometry chart of the system. Okay, just the simplest setting. Okay. Good. Um, okay, so if it's more or less clear, I, let me go further, right? Uh, good. Um, so in order, to, so again, so I looking at this Hamilton, I change the Z and I see whether I have a bound state or not. Okay, but in order to see if I have a bound state or not, I need to understand what happens if one of the electrons is indeed very far away, it's kicked away because it cannot be bound. So I need to understand the one electron problem. And this is quite sort of easy, okay? I can write down the Hamilton like this, which is essentially the, uh, Hamiltonian for the usual hydrogen atom, but I just impose the boundary condition that the wave function of the electron has a node, the plane is equal to zero. So it amounts just to looking at those Legend or associated Legend polynomials which vanish at zero. Okay, and there is this nice formula. And if I put x equal to zero and look at it, and I immediately get the answer, what are the eigenstates of this guy? The eigenstates are this. Okay, so it's zero below the the boundary above the boundary is just the say uh, eigenstate of the hydrogen like atom but of course because of the, the norm is, is different i need to uh because the space is okay it's, it's twice as small so i need to have this prefactor in front for the two and there are these irregular quantum numbers n uh, m known from the hydrogen atom but the, i have certain constraints on these numbers imposed by this boundary and these are the following. So the n has to be larger than two. Okay, so not larger than one as usual. Okay, because the n equal to one is just the s state. It doesn't have a node there, of course. But in the n, if I go to n equal to one, I, I can find something with a node. Okay, pr has to be at least one, so it has to rotate somehow. The angular momentum has to be at least uh, one. And 
as usual, it cannot be larger than the say what they call the radial quantum number. Again, if I have the projection on the z-axis of the angular momentum, it has to be smaller than L. But at the same time, like the absolute value of m plus L, this has to be an odd number. Okay. So the mag magnetic quantum number, absolute value of the magnetic quantum number plus the angular momentum for the principal quantum number, this has to be an uh, odd number. Okay. And this actually follows from this formula okay, for the Legendre polynomial, one of the representation of the Legendre polynomials. Okay, so in particular, the ground state, so the, which in our original problem is the situation where I have one electron bound and the other is at infinity, is just this function. Okay, this is just a fancy way of writing, uh, just ensuring that I'm zero below the surface. Uh, and the, the energies are uh, like this, that the, the, the same ones as for the hydrogen atom. But they start at two, and the degeneracy goes down from n squared to this to n times n minus one over two, because of course I have less state because the symmetry is broken. Okay, I still have some symmetries. I have the degeneracy, but the symmetry is like a smaller type. Okay, uh, so the ground state is minus z squared over a in this case. So that's something that may come out later as well. And I have like all these others, a half orbitals, so pre d zero, pre d one, pre d minus one. If I'm not wrong, <laughs> it's like chemical nomenclature for this. Okay, good. So uh, again, so our original problem is to find the, uh, to answer the question, where do I have a bound state? And uh, for this, it's enough just to have a nice trial, like a good trial wave function that can predict the existence of a bound state. Okay, and then just start off with something simple. It's something which is a natural analog of the wave function that Chandra Sekhar was using for H minus. It's essentially a symmetric combination of the wave functions of the electrons, okay, which are essentially the bound states, the ground states of the, of a system with charges, say, alpha and beta, which, in other words, is just because, you see, the z, it uh, governs the decay of this exponential function, so alpha and beta, or z here, are essentially like the effective inverse Bohr radii, okay, they set the scale on how far every of the electrons is from the nucleus, okay, and I just take alpha for one of the electrons. So it sits at one over alpha from the nucleus on average. The other sits at one over beta. And I symmetrize them because I don't know which is which. They're like uh, uh, und undistinguishable. And actually, they can correlate their radial positions by adjusting the values of alpha and beta. One can be further, the other can be closer. Okay. They can somehow adjust their values. Okay. So it's a simple wave function, but in fact, it, it's a uh, essentially a product, but it has some correlation via this effective uh, Bohr radii, the effective charges, okay? And the ni another nice thing about this, actually, if you want to reproduce the limit when none of the electrons is detached, then it just corresponds to sending either of these numbers to zero, okay? Because it means that the effective Bohr radius is infinite for either of the electrons, okay? So one can somehow study the limit of what happens at the very, very slightly bound system by sending this alpha and beta to uh, either alpha or beta to zero. Good. And uh, well, I can compute the expected values quite easily. So the kinetic energy is maybe, it's actually, it's very easy. It just looks like something that you would have for uncorrelated electrons time plus a certain term, term which somehow correlates the two. The potential energy is completely uncorrelated. That's the thing you would you would have just for like two independent electrons. What's maybe more tricky, but still can be done, is the electronic repulsion, okay? Because this is something that's not so easy to evaluate because of the presence of the boundary, but still it can be done. It can be presented analytically as a certain series. And the origin of this series is in the multiple expansion, okay? Mm -hmm. So of course, it's not very important what pre the precise values are here. Just what's important to know is that this, uh, uh, this repulsion can be Expanded in the uh, can be expanded as a series which stems from the uh, multiple expansion. And uh, each term here is like a product of something which comes from the angular integration, okay, and something which comes from the radial integration. And this thing that involves radial integration is within something which is analytic, is called the hypergeometric function. Whereas the CLs, actually, if you look at them, gamma is the Euler gamma function, you see that in this series, you only have odd terms. You only have two even terms. It's L equal to zero, L equal to two. Or the others say 
uh, even uh, moments they disappear okay because of the of the fact that something put like something even here then this this blows up so this is zero okay so maybe this points out something uh, good and now okay so we you see that's a wave function that's a trial wave function so it's not going to be very accurate with the simple form but qualitatively can answer can give you an answer whether a boundary exists or not okay so you can just compute the binding energy so in other words minimize this sum of this expected values over alpha and beta and look what the minimal number is and then subtract minus d squared over eight right because that's the energy of the un, of the, the unbound system okay and you can do it and you see that from this that the critical charge is equal to one uh, and it's true in this uh, in this ansatz but the important point is actually that we know a priori that for z smaller than one we cannot have a bound state and the reason is that we cannot that for the h minus a union there's no excited state so if, we, if i had a bound state for z equal one and lower this would imply the existence of the excited state for the hydrogen ion because i could contract an excited state for the hydrogen anion out of the ground state of this guy okay just by a symmetrization okay uh, so in other words if i have a wave function that leads to binding for z larger than one it means that z equal one is critical okay and why we are happy so the first reason why we are happy is that z equal one it's like more plausible to maybe see somewhere for zero point than zero point nine to one right so it appears that uh, in this particular setting, it, there is a hope that actually I can see the critical chart somewhere because this is equal one for something that you can have. Okay, of course you can look at the dielectric effects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but still, it is like a regular, say, you know, integer. Okay, it's something that you can hope to see. The other thing is about the uh, the space transition. I told you. I don't know if I have time still. Uh, yes, uh, you have time to uh, one thirty. So you have. Ah, so I'm very fast, you see. Okay. You have 23 minutes. Okay. Okay, so I'm more or less done, but uh, yeah, but I can do it, we can go slowly. Okay, so Z equal one is critical. We found this because we, we found a, something that leads to binding. The second thing is about the power law. So actually one can say fit it, okay, what happens for Z very close to one. And one can reason in the following way so not fit but just predict what should be there what should be the power law right we think of it as a phase transition and we think okay it should be z minus one squared and why do we think about it okay it somehow seems like one of the electrons is very close the other is very far so the first electron it just screens the first the the, the, the the whole almost completely okay so what's left is the z minus one and the far electrons is the z minus one and then I, it's okay, so the binding energy should be more or less the energy of somebody bound to Z plus somebody bound to Z minus one, and I subtract somebody bound to Z, to Z and, I, uh, and I get minus Z minus one squared over eight. Okay, so there should be a power law with an exponent two. That's fair enough, okay? The exponent appears, it turns out to be right, but the amplitude, the one over eight, is not. So the one over eight is because of the Z squared over eight in the ground state of the boundary plus a charge okay plus one charge it's one one over eight but you see if you actually do it properly you will see that the amplitude is not one over eight it's something different the, the, the square that's okay but the amplitude is different and the reason why the amplitude is different actually you cannot write it like this okay you cannot and you cannot write it like this because of electron correlations it's something that really want to understand this and how to do it okay so as i told you I, if I have these expected values, then the um, binding edge should correspond to either of them going to zero. Okay. So what I do, I take these ex expected values I have now, and beta, keep beta fixed, and um, expand everything in alpha, which I seem to be small. Okay. For the kinetic energy, this means that, and I want to actually retain terms up to second order, right? The smallest non-trivial order. And if you look at the kinetic energy, then it means that actually I can disregard this altogether, okay? Because this thing is it's much like I said, just alpha squared. Whereas here, uh, I have um, uh, this guy is already fine, okay? This is linear. But what's maybe non trivial here is the electron repulsion, okay? This object here. So in order to expand this guy in small alpha, I need to know something about the hypergeometric function. Okay, which is here 
And uh, fortunately, there are the, the asymptotic loss for this hypergeometric function has been established. So depending on the values of this A, B, and C, which for us corresponds to like uh, essentially what the value of L, right? Because the other parameters are fixed. So depending on the values of these, uh, say of R, it either is either a constant for one of them going to one for this argument going to one, or it blows up either with a power law or as a logarithm. Okay. And actually, if you look at this and compare with what you have, then you come to the conclusion that you can expand all, you you may expand only to only this L equal to zero and equal to one terms in this whole series to get terms that are of order alpha squared, because all the other terms will give you something of higher order. Okay. And if you then expand it very carefully, you arrive at something like this, okay, for the sum of the expected value. So the expected value on the trial wave function, it has essentially three terms, one dependent only on beta, one dependent only on alpha, and something that correlates them. Right? This, it correlates them because alpha comes with the beta together, so to say. And uh, so if I, if I forget about this term, I have one and two, and this one and two corresponds exactly to this naive picture of this complete squiggly. Okay, you have something with a, seeing a chart C and something seeing a chart Z minus one. And this minus one here it somehow determines the critical charge and it comes from the L zero term in the expansion. So it's like the monopole term. It determines the minus one. Here. Whereas this thing actually, actually, and you see actually, you cannot forget about it because you have a term of order alpha squared, which has the correlation. It goes from the L equal one term. So it's essentially uh, like a charge dipole interaction. Okay, it's essentially like a charge dipole interaction. So they are correlated by a charge dipole interaction. And then you can optimize this almost by hand and you find this power law, okay, which fits very well here. Find this power law with a different amplitude. It's instead of like a half of a quarter, we get one over 23. So it gets reduced because of the correlation effects, okay? The correlation effects here are positive. This, this term is positive. So actually you have a smaller binding that you would expect just based on the naive picture, okay? And this optimization also gives you the, as, well, how the effective Bohr radii uh, behave asymptotically. So the critical value of this is zero and the critical value of this is one half. And you see actually this also fits quite well, okay? I'm just not very quantitative, but I'm just like a picture for the press okay so the conclusion of this we found uh, a system which has a like reasonable critical nuclear charge and our description somehow allows to very is very simple but it allows us allows us to uh, see the critical exponents okay interpret the critical binding as a phase transition extract the amplitudes and of course this is something that you can compare it if you'd like to do proper calculation not this essentially back of the envelope thing we did. Exaggerating a bit, but because you can still think about something, but it's like not like the proper quantum chemistry calculation, but at least it produces something which is interesting and on trivial and points out this possibility of having like a reasonable critical charge. Of course, there are much more serious object uh, objections to it than just uh, that we are not using proper quantum chemistry. Of course, we forget about the dielectric effects. We forget about the finite size effects, etc. So this would require like really constructing dry Hamiltonian, finding the potential, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a quite a complicated thing to do. However, if I just do the following thing that I have a, just a, that's the boundary. Okay, one dielectric, other dielectric and a hole sits on the boundary. This is something that actually can be solved. And it looks quite interesting because the potential in this case, uh, it's like one over R and in front you get like the inverse of the mean value of the dielectric coefficients of the two actually so it means that essentially if you neglect the image charges in the problem of the image charges of the electrons just look at the potential that the hole generates okay then it looks a bit promising but it just says that by changing these two numbers okay or actually one of them you can have as effectively a critical a z which is a coupling which you can tune continuously but only by changing the materials okay so this simple calculation somehow raises hope that this is possible. Okay, so I want to reproduce these curves. Okay, somehow and study maybe other effects. But I would be, I mean, this is very optimistic, 
because this thing is much more complicated. So I'm not claiming uh, this is as promising as we might think, but nevertheless, I guess what we have found is quite interesting and maybe it's, uh, it's worth attention of the experimentalists and other people working on this chemistry stuff. So I guess that was my last slide and uh, I thank you for your attention. I hope I was not too fast and uh, thank you a lot. <laughs> So, any questions for Christoph's talk? Yes. You mentioned that uh, quantum chemistry has become quite an industry. Uh, what about energy levels of iron atom? Can you compute it or you have to get it from spectroscopy? I don't know. I, I suspect that you're, you're suggesting that it's not possible to find them very well. Well, I have an <laughs> argument with about power of quantum computations, the chemist, and uh, she actually argued that the things like that, the multi-electron spectra mm -hmm. are taking, taken from experiment, not from yeah, first actually, principle. I, as far as I know, many of these calculations, there are like, not really first principles because there is some input, at least something that you have to have from experiments, not everywhere, but it seems like 80% first principles, but there is some fitting at the end, and to help you with the fitting, you get there was also then a, a good example of uh, current possibilities of quantum chemistry, computational quantum chemistry. What could you do? I mean, you could, of course, like because H two minus system is a simple one. We can yes, of course, it. but we can like predict the structure of even proteins, right? Mm -hmm. This can be done. As, as almost every molecule, actually, at least of course, you're not. There are still some open problems, right, with uh, which lack the accuracy, but still in quantitative terms, qualitative terms, you can say a lot about, say, predict whether a reaction happens or not, etc. Predict how it happens. These things can be done. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. What about relativistic yeah. corrections? Is it known which way they are acting, increasing or decreasing the results? Yes, yeah, so it's, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, that's a good question. So for instance, I'm not, because one question one could ask, I mean, I just, let me go back to this like original things, because this phase diagram is for sure only for non-relativistic and the mass change. So I'm not sure if anybody did this, uh, like for Dirac version, that's a good question. So it would be like a good way of seeing what, how does this change? Self correction. Yes, the corrections to this. Yes, well, so this is only like the simplest thing, just the infinite nucleus mass, and the, yes, and these and these are the Laplacians. So the direct equation perhaps is too much. One can just take the lowest relativistic correction, the lowest order. It could be like one of the four to power. Yes, yes. I I don't know. That's a good question. Whether in orbit coupling. Yes, I, in particular, which comes from this. Exactly, place. exactly. But somehow I, I'd say the first thing to do would be to see what happens with this value, for instance. And uh, yes, and maybe about this excited state could be also a good thing because, because the proof of the absence of this of this ex excited state is it was also quite ex restrictive. So it was infinite mass. And then I think they had the finite mass finite mass of the proton as well, but, uh, and it was a challenge to see it. And I wonder if the qualitatively actually can have that bound state really somehow excited state up there. So it's, uh, I don't know. So, but what, what I'm quite sure is that nobody has done it till now. Nobody has extended this in this direction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions either from the audience or? I yeah, have a question. So you, you, you mentioned that somehow the, the, the core of the of the effect that you can add this one one extra electron uh, lies in the electron electron correlation. Yes. Uh, in your model, the one with the boundary. Uh, yes. Do you see it there somehow? Like, can you like, point it where? where, where yeah, it in a way, yes. It's in this uh... where it resides, where it where it lives. Like, I mean, what it, I can see its effect, and I see it's very in this value of this amplitude instead of one eight, which would be here without the correlation. Okay, okay. I have one over twenty three. So in a way, this correlates the two, 
if I and this does it on the on the level of alpha squared already. So it's already. So you, see, so you, it, can, you can you can trace this one over twenty three somehow, right? Yeah, I can trace it. Yes, I can trace this up to, from to this term, and this term I also know where it's from. Okay. So where is it from? So is it if you look at this? Uh, that's the election. That's this integral. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the column column repulsion of the electrons, and I can represent it in this way. I can compute it as a series, and this essentially this term, this. 15 over 32 alpha squared over theta, it goes, it comes from the L equal one term of this expansion. Oh. So it's like sort of a charge dipole thing. So there's an effective correlation in terms of something simple. So in that way, I'm saying that we see something simple in terms of the correlation that we interpret quickly. Okay. So that's one of the that's one of, one of the nice things about these computations that we see this effect as a relatively simple one. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Any questions either from the audience or uh, from people? Yes. Yeah. I have a very um, dumb question about this plot you showed um, with the, you were changing the mass ratio and the, the charge and there's a critical line. Uh, so I'm quite sorry about your work, I guess uh, it's old stuff. But, um, yeah, it's very old stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you have, there are a bunch of examples here of like helium and other the yes, that can be one, you want yeah. to muons and a proton. So why do all of these things appear on the critical line and not anywhere else in the diagram? Huh. Uh, I thought it was kind of spooky. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're uh huh. But I mean uh blah, blah, blah. So let me think about it for a moment. Uh because I actually I don't know this plot by heart, but well, my first answer would be that just just are examples, but I don't think so because this number one point ten it really agrees with one of with the inverse of zero point ninety one, so to suggest mm -hmm. that it's really on the on the boundary, which means that if you change the mass slightly, you don't have binding. Yes, yeah, at this at this uh... ah you see uh -huh. sorry sorry because th no no that's right because see you see you see here you have the composition, but you change the coupling. So the exact coupling which happens in nature can be somewhere below. Okay. Uh, For instance, here you have helium, right? But the actual coupling is 0 0.91, which is not helium, which is something different. I see, okay? I see. So it's just like these are the critic, okay. this would the like the sequences of things, right? They're going yeah, here. Yeah. So okay. So, so that's like, correct, but like yes, you said, yes, yeah, exactly. So these are the say uh anal so the critical things here are the analogs of the following systems. Okay. okay? Yeah, you. so it makes sense now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so people you know. So when you know when you change it actually this geometry of boundary yes instead of like uh, one uh, two dimensional boundary you you just make a spherical actually boundary do yes. you expect to, you can simulate almost same as uh, like uh, ordinary like real any on yes so I was I mean you're asking about the actual experiments right or about right. the calculations yeah. yes because I was thinking about it as well in. Just, I mean, what would one would expect that the, the higher the space for the electrons is, the larger is for them to, the higher the probability for them to form a bound state because they can somehow alleviate the Coulomb repulsion by having a larger phase space, right? They can somehow avoid each other more effectively. And I was thinking about really <clears throat> simulating this system I have in mind, not with excitons, but with sort of um, droplets of helium and put ions on the surface and you have some like charges around. And this things like this can have been done. I mean, not not precisely this, but this experiments with helium droplets and ions on the surface, and uh, they did experiments on the solvation process, how it happens, from how this ion is kicked out of it, and how many of the helium atoms does it attach to itself. This was sort of like a solvation. So experiments, very precise experiments of this sort have been done. I was thinking, okay, maybe one can maybe measure spectroscopically something like an ion on a surface and a helium droplet and two charges around okay so then this was then as a first approximation this is right like it is here if this droplet is very large but if you like if it takes finite size effects into account it's this changes but i think still like having like spherical boundary and two electrons can be also maybe maybe it's also tractable who knows could be okay so maybe i will ask another question uh i'm not very much familiar with this uh, with this field at all i wonder if there's a any possibility to approach this problem by uh, very slowly fine-tuning the parameters appearing here and then 
putting the system into a ground state and then state and then so during, for example, the central charge decreasing very slowly and see what happens. Uh, but decreasing the yes, charge. I mean, this is what people do. do. For instance, Bakutsky does something like this because I think he did calculations of this kind for n equal three. And that's precisely what he did. So he had a very accurate way of calculating the, the wave function. Then he was just asymptotically changing the z and seeing what happens. Okay. So, yeah, so, I mean, just changing the z step by step and see what the solution does. Okay. So he knows more, more details if you already have some ideas. So, any more questions? I don't see any. So, let's take our, our guest today. So,